gosh, it was 93. I was at the Board of Trade trading bond futures in Chicago. My brother was going to Arizona State University. And you know, as I wrote about in the book, um, we're all products of our environment, you know? And I had a great environment growing up, I had a great family, had every opportunity for education, every opportunity to have loving, supportive people around me. But uh, after I left college, I went to go work at the Board of Trade. And that environment is, embraces the gray areas. That environment, when you, when you use the word successful, honest trader, or successful, honest, ethical trader, those are oxymorons to me. Because in order to achieve success on the floor or any trading floor of any exchange, you have to play in the gray area. So when I'm 22, 23, 24 years old, I'm the product of that environment. And you know, one thing leads to another, and you know, Benny Silman and I kind of developed a relationship, and um, it turns out that Headache Smith was indebted to him because Benny had a bookmaking operation at Arizona State. From what I heard from Benny uh, during that time, it was around twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars that that headache was into him that he still owed, in addition to what he had already paid over that course of time. And Benny calls you, and and he literally spells out. The word fix, F I X. I've got them. Yeah. We can do this. And, and quite frankly, the light goes on, and, and, and you say, okay, let's take a roll at this. Now, that's a big jump. That's a leap of faith that, number one, can you even pull it off? That, that this could actually align, a betting line could be managed. I think a lot of people are still confused to this day. How does that happen? How can you manage? A betting line, and and for the to educate us from that standpoint, because it was Oregon State the first game. Yeah, you know, it, it was probably a bit easier in hindsight, looking back now, a bit easier in '93, '94. Technology wasn't then what it is now. Um, to manage a betting line, um, we used 32, 33 different casinos in Las Vegas, half of which aren't even even open anymore. Um, the sports books, not sports books, but the bookies. Um, on the East Coast and the Midwest. Those guys weren't really as dialed in as they are today because today pretty much everything goes offshore. So a larger action is charted. Line moves, uh, line movements are charted more nowadays than they were back then. ASU's a favorite, ASU's yeah. a favorite. And Steven says, you know, we don't, we don't have to lose the game. We can win by six. Right. And and I you know, I looked at the box scores, Joe. You understand, I'm a reporter and I'm trying to figure out I, I don't think it can happen. But as I read the book, no gray areas right here, I look at it and I say, Okay, Stevens says he can he can make sure ASU wins and in his mind there's some morality to that, but I'll make sure we win by only six. Explain. You know, looking back, when you talk about uh, the first time that Benny contacted me and told the word fix and spelled out the letters word fix, it, it's like a Kodak moment in my mind because I was at, I was in Chicago. I lived in a high-rise building. I was on the 14th floor. I was looking out the window. I was on a white portable phone, and it was snowing outside. It was early January, um, maybe mid-January. It was right before the Super Bowl. And... Um, he said, Joe, I got a fix. And I kind of shrugged it off. I shrugged it off like I didn't want him to think I didn't know what he was talking about because it didn't click to me at all. So finally he spelled it out, F-I-X. Jude, here it is, what, 20 years later? I remember that, that sound in my head like it was yesterday. It's crazy what you remember. But um, and he started telling me about headache. He started telling me about headache leading the Pac-10. It was the Pac-10 at that time, not the Pac-12. Leading the Pac-10 in minutes played. Leading the Pac-10 in three-point field goals made and attempted in uh, free throws. Pac-10 Defensive Player of the Year. He said, Joe, the guy's a stud. He's an absolute stud, and he's into me. And I told him that I don't own the book. I told him that some mob figure in Chicago owns the book and that headache doesn't owe me, meaning Benny, he owes the mob in Chicago. So that's how Benny set this whole thing up. So, you know, if I was gonna put money into the deal back then, 
I wanted to verify and validate a little further. So I said, you know, Benny, I'm not sure. Put this guy on the phone. And um, I talked to him. And, you know, it's, as I wrote about, I remember hearing his voice tremor on the phone. Like he was intimidated. He didn't know who the heck I was. Um, I probably should have said my name was Guido or something like that. It probably would have resonated more, but um, he, he was intimidated. And, but he said to me very clearly, and I have respect for him for this, he said, I will not lose. I said, man, I don't want you to lose. Just don't win by more than I tell you. That's what I told him. And so I said, are you in? He said, I'll do this for you, but I will not lose. And I'll only fix two games because then I'm going to have to turn my game up for the NBA scouts. I said, okay, that's all I need are two. So I said, I'll get back to Benny in a couple days. Let me look at the schedule. Let me try to pick a game out. So I looked at the remaining schedule at that point for ASU, and there was a home stand against Oregon State in Oregon. And ASU was playing pretty well that year, and I knew they'd be a double-digit favorite. And that's all we needed. He scored 39 points. I remember looking at yeah. that box score. He had 10 threes. Yeah. And I'm saying, that the guy doesn't put up 39 and manage or manipulate a game. But that's what happened. You know, what's funny, people think a fix or shaving points or however you want to, however you want to term it um, is about an offensive performance. It's not. It's not. The guy could, he torched the lamp up that night. He, he had, you know, 39 points and was a career high. But it was about what he did off the ball, what he did defensively, you know, giving the other guard an extra two or three feet on a jump shot or or a, a, you know, not playing defense as, as attentively as he could have, or you know, maybe breaking a few free throws down the stretch. So that's really how a fix like that is played. But you know, I had no idea he put up 39 points. I was in Vegas at that time, and um, that game was not on satellite. And so I literally sat there with my dad and a few other guys in the sports book at Bally's, watching the ticker go back and forth. And so I was getting updates. I was getting sporadic updates probably every 5, 10, 10 minutes type of thing. I had no idea this kid put up 39 points until after I talked to, after the game when I talked to Benny. And he won by six. Exactly. Right on the exact number he told you. Exactly on the number. And what's, what's, what really resonates with me still is I told him it had to land on six headache six is the number it has to be there and it was amazing you're looking at Stephen Smith and you say talk about the Bronx tale and you spoke with Benny but you also made a very interesting point you said on reflection I can't help but think about headache and how he wasted his talent for money I often think where would he be had I not influenced him to make this fateful decision 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 that would end his career before it started. Even there, you're, you're somewhat contrite in going down this road. Explain. Um, explain. I think the best way to explain that is for years after the sentencing. Jude, I look to rationalize everything. I look to point the blame. I look to point the blame at the casinos that took the action. I look to point the blame at other people that may have uh, lured me into this thing or convinced me that, hey, it was acceptable. Point the blame at my environment at the Board of Trade. but. You know, and I was upset. I was upset that, hey, I got sentenced to 15 months in prison. And I was upset that in my mind, as warped as it sounds, that the players, uh, Isaac Burton only got 60 days in prison. Uh, Headache Smith only got a year and a day. And for years, I was upset with that. I was upset because in my mind, everything stopped and started with them on the court. Sure, I went out and made a few bets. Sure, I may have coerced them to do something. But they performed the deed. So for years, I was aggravated with that. That how come those sentences were so light? But probably about five, 10 years ago, it clicked with me. We all got punished. We all got punished in our own ways. Headache got out, you know, he lost a career. Late, we all got labeled a felon that day when we got sentenced, but Headache lost a career. You know, Benny got 
the felony label and couldn't do certain things. We all got you know, scrutinized in the spotlight as you know, one of the largest sports scandals in history. So we all got punished in our own way. You now get to the Washington game, and you're not feeling very comfortable. You're saying, we're almost pressing our luck here, uh, enough for it. You really, truly wanted to walk away. And then Headache kind of says, man, I, just one more, just one more. And now it's becoming obvious, because a lot of people never understood how the story broke and went national. There are students coming up to Vegas in their flip-flops, laying action on a <laughs> meaningless game at that point. Yeah. ASU is no longer in NCAA tournament contention. They are favored by at least 12 over Washington. And you're going one more time. Take us through that part of the book. I didn't want anything to do with game four. I could tell you that is from the depths of my heart. I wanted nothing to do with game four. Uh, you know, Benny, had called after, you know, game three, I'll back up for a second on game three. Game three, the USC game, happened not because I wanted it to happen, but because Headache called me back in Chicago to bet on himself. They were playing UCLA. And he said, Joe, we never, uh, we never uh, beat UCLA. Um, I've been a, I'm a senior, we never beat them. I wanna bet on myself. I said, do you have the money to pay me? He said, we're not gonna lose. I'm not gonna worry about that. I said, okay. So, you know, I wrote about it in the book. That was a great game I, and he played his heart out, but he ended up losing. He lost $22,000 to me that day and he had no way to pay it. So what does he do? He fixes game three, the next game on, on that Saturday against USC. You know, I personally, as I told you off camera, Jude, I don't think the game even needed to be fixed. I think, I think USC just pounded them that day. Maybe it was a letdown against the USC game or UCLA game a couple days earlier, but so, you know, we ended up cashing the tickets. I cashed a boatload of tickets on the USC game and I thought I was done. That was game three, done. Two weeks later, my phone rings. It's headache. No, I'm sorry. It's Benny. It's Benny. It's St. Joe, I just got off the phone with headache. And, you know, ASU just lost to Washington State. Their chances of making the tournament now are questionable. We got one more game left. We got Washington coming up. We'll be a double digit favorite. Let's do this. One more game. I said, Benny, I want no part of it. And I kind of saw a lot of these college kids with ASU shirts running around Vegas, emptying shoe boxes like, like they knew the final score. And that's what happened in game four. I knew that in my mind when Benny called me for game four, I knew that if I told him I wasn't going to do it, that they were going to do it anyway. And I knew I was already knee deep. There was a, it was at a point of no return for me at that point. When I wrote this, it's the first time that the true details are out there. Uh, the first time that the truth is out there in terms of what happened behind the scenes, how much money was involved. You know, when we got indicted, um, I think the government showed three, four, five hundred thousand bucks on the indictment. And that's great, but it's not a hundred percent of the truth. And I get why they did it, because I got indicted on a 72 count indictment. Every bet that they were able to track, every bet that they were able to prove that I made was a count. So what difference does it make, or what difference does it make if they say Gagliano bet three, four hundred thousand and we're gonna give him 72 indictments or, or 72 counts, or Gagliano bet three to four or five million bucks and we're gonna give him a thousand count indictment. <laughs> it's just piling on at that point. So the, the, the thing that I tried to focus on, I think there's 25, 26 chapters in the books and in the book and only eight chapters are about the ASU event is because it's ir irrelevant in my mind. And I know the public is gonna look at it differently. The public is gonna say, wow, how much money was involved? But that's not the case. Whether it was three, four, five hundred thousand or whether it was three, four, five million, the simplicity of how it happened, that's the thing it should be focused on. How do you come to terms now as you are sitting in prison after the conviction? you're sent to federal prison and you're staring at the walls. What are you thinking about? You, you know, um, but like I said earlier, Jude, for a long time, I rationalized it. I rationalized it and said, hey, you know, sure I was in the gray area. Uh, sure I went to Vegas, I made a few bets, but that's okay. 
I didn't hurt anyone. I didn't rob anyone. I didn't rape or pillage anyone. I didn't steal from anyone. I went to Vegas and made a few bets on games that I knew were fixed. That's how I made peace with it for years. And never, although I was I brought up with great family values, I knew right from wrong. My father was a police officer in Chicago. Man, you know, we had a strong family, and we still do. But um, I rationalized it for a long time. When did you get to that moment? Because as time goes on, you're a very successful entrepreneur. You're doing very well with businesses. Then it goes south again. And through an SBA loan and other things, you find yourself in a pickle again, Joe. When did the light go on when you said, looked in your heart and soul and said, I've got to come to terms with, with what I've done? And, and when did you finally say, it's on me? Man, this is where it gets tough, June. It, it, you know, when I got indicted, uh, the world fell apart. You know, we had a financial disaster in 2008, and I had some real estate out there and um, scrambled and did an SBA loan with my father, as I've done three times prior to that. My father was a business partner with me. At the same time, my father was suffering with cancer. Um, and, you know, so I look at it, I looked at it then, whereas I look at it then different than how I look at it now. I look at it now saying, hey, it's black and white. I looked at it then saying, hey, it's a, it's a gray area, no one's really going to care. So it wasn't until after the indictment for the SBA loan that I realized, I finally put myself in check through a lot of different things that happened, and I wrote about it in that journey. Um, you know, sure, I, could, I was rationalizing that, hey, I was, I was mad, dude. I was, I was mad that I can get indicted for a loan that I had no intent to defraud. I had no monetary gain whatsoever. There was never an intent to deceive or steal or anything like that. I was a trustee of my family's estate, and we had loan docs come in, and I authorized and allowed those loan docs to be signed without my father's permission. And I rationalized it thinking, hey, I'm the trustee. It's okay. I've, I've done this before. It's no big deal. But it was a big deal. It was wrong. It was wrong. I should have got a power of attorney. It's the right way to do things. So, you know, there's right and there's wrong and there's gray. And I played in the gray. And sure, I could sit here and say that, hey, I was a target because of the ASU thing 20 years earlier. I was, I was low-hanging fruit for the government, and I was easy for them to get a notch in their, um, in their belt. And I said that for a while, because I was pissed. It was anger, angry that, that this was happening to me. How could I get indicted again for something I didn't really do with intent to defraud? There was no fraud. But then I came to terms with it, and I finally realized, you know what? I was wrong. I was completely wrong. And then you get to the old typewriter. Yeah. And you say, I'm going to tell my story in no gray areas. And you decide not to just tell your story, but you decide, I think, in a very courageous way to say, I'm coming clean, and I'm going to give back. I want my message to get out there to people that tinker with gambling. Don't go where I have been. <laughs> Take us through that part of the story because it's where you're at today. You know, it, it, as I said, it was an interesting process. And when I turned myself into prison, you know, it, it's when I got indicted and pled guilty for the second felony in my life and was labeled a two-time felon in uh, December 2012, I can tell you that the first Sunday in, in 2013, I was searching for different ways to kill myself on the Internet. I... I Googled the top 10, top 10 ways to kill myself. And, you know, as warped as this is going to sound, I came here to this church, Impact Church, on that Sunday to ask God to forgive me for what I was about to do. You know, and, it's, and things aren't always on time, but they're, they're, it, it, it worked out. They're not always on our time, but it's, they're always on time, is what I should say. Because I walked in that day and you know, ran into a couple people here that I haven't seen for years, and they just embraced me. 
And they said, Joe, we're going to get you through this. And that process evolved. And, you know, obviously I'm here today and, and those suicidal thoughts got behind me. But you talk about writing the book. You know, I got sentenced. I got sentenced to 30 months. And that was a shock that day because we really didn't think that would happen like that. We were, you know, when I agreed to plead guilty, uh, we thought the sentence would be a little lesser. But it didn't happen that way. And so I went, you know, I had a lot of free time in prison. And my goal was at this point now, you know, with this felony, my, my oldest was 19 years old, my youngest was five. My goal was to put everything down on paper for them. So, God forbid something happens to me today or tomorrow, they could look back and understand why I made certain choices, why certain things happened in my life. Yeah, my dad was a felon, yeah, my dad went to prison, but this is why, and that was the goal. This is an unbelievably compelling read. I also want to give you a stage in front of these cameras, Joe, because we haven't heard from you in many of these years publicly like this. Whether it be BSU, whether it be Stevin Smith, whether it be the people you've come in contact with, what do you want them to know about Joe Gagliano now that you've written this book and now that you're in the place that you're in? What's the most important part of this message as you speak to them? The, 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 import, the, the most important thing that I wanted people to have their takeaway from that book is to evaluate life choices to understand life choices, to realize that every choice they make will have a consequence, no matter how small it is, no matter how big it is, it's gonna have a, comp it's gonna have a consequence. And once they compromise themselves, once they compromise their integrities, and they get off center, they will find it extremely difficult to get back to center. That was the biggest message I wanted to make in that book. That's what I wanted to leave people with. The ASU thing, Jude, is the sizzle. I get it, but there's so much more to that. It, it, it's been a journey. It's been a journey, and I wanted to put it on paper. At, like I said, at first it was for my kids, but then after I had a few people that I really trust in my circle read it, they said there was a bigger message here. And I'm a two-time felon, Jude. You know, I'm a two-time felon. I've got a ton of obstacles to overcome. But, um, you know, if I could help somebody out there in making a choice, help if I could hit somebody in a way where they could say, man, that, I could relate to that, or that could happen to me, then maybe everything has a purpose then at that point.